I used to feel like Republicans were better at denouncing the more extreme factions of their movement. Neo-Nazis and the alt-right have been denounced by all the right-wing leaders and politicians for as long as I can remember. Even though Donald Trump is probably closer to the edge of the Overton window than Joe Biden, Joe and other mainstream Democrats don't often denounce the socialists and communists the way that the conservatives have denounced white nationalists. And no one on the right denounced them louder than the Daily Wire. That's a very good synopsis of what the alt-right believes. And he's not the only one who says this. Richard Spencer, one of the guys who was at this rally yesterday, uh, a sort of Nazi sympathizing piece of garbage. And Nick Fuentes lied to my face, then lied about me on the internet. And then only when I figured out who he was because I Googled him, I realized, and some might try to refute this in the room, but it's all on video, that he has endorsed Jim Crow segregation. He has denied that the Holocaust happened. He has associated himself with fascism openly. He said if Antifa were fascist, he would be marching alongside them. He has associated in the past with avowed racial bigots like James Alsop and Richard Spencer, though apparently now they're having something of a tiff from what I gather on the blogs. It is quite clear to me that he harbors racial bigotry. That's why I reject his politics. This is a letter from one of these Kruiper people that I was talking about. What I'm, what I am against, what I am against is demographic fatalism. I'm against the idea that new kinds of people coming in cannot be assimilated into the American system. That's absurd. It's, it's what people have said every single time and every single time they have been assimilated in. All this bigotry only works because you discount the evil things that other people did. Every race has evil people. Every race has good people. All I'm going to tell you, pal, is like, I, I know, I know that hatred like this makes you feel strong. I know that it makes you feel like a big guy. I know that it makes you feel like you're in a group of people who are smarter than everybody else and are in on the secret and we're the Christians, we're the last Christians on earth. And you're afraid, you're afraid to let it go. But this wasn't just the Daily Wire denouncing far-right factions because they disagree with them. The Daily Wire was founded by now CEO Jeremy Boring and now lead editor and the person with the most popular commentator show on the platform, Ben Shapiro. The alt-right was a new group of conservatives led by Richard Spencer that was meant to separate from the boomers version of conservatism, a populist conservatism for younger generations. The alt-right isn't just a movement, but an idea for a better future where people who look like you and think like you can prosper. It consists of many subgroups and organizations like American Renaissance, America First, and many leaders like Jared Taylor and Nick Fuentes, each group with their own goals and ideals. Some are atheists and some are Christians. Some are nationalist socialists, while others believe in capitalism. But there are a number of things that they all agree on that brings them together. Diversity is ruining America. White people should be the majority. And Jewish people are the ones who are stopping them from being able to achieve their goals. And Ben Shapiro, the face of the biggest conservative independent media organization, was definitely Jewish. Like the white nationalists, they're responsible for a lot of bad things. They're evil. They, talk, they don't like people like me with my funny little hat and my Judaism and everything. Ben was one of the biggest targets of harassment by the alt-right. Not only was he Jewish, but he represented the old conservatism of the neocons, the George Bush Republican that needed to get out of the way for newer, younger generations. The alt-right were big fans of Trump and his immigration policies helping him get elected in 2016. They're controlled fully by the lobbyists, by the donors, and by the special interests fully. The mostly online group didn't get very much national attention and continued to quietly grow through YouTubers like Gavin McGinnis, Lauren Southern, and Stefan Molyneux until 2017 when they had their biggest gathering yet. Over 4,000 white nationalists from all over the world gathered in Charlottesville, Virginia for their Unite the Right rally when a man got in his car and drove into a crowd killing one woman and injuring dozens more. It was considered another terrorist attack among many from the far right and got mainstream coverage from all the biggest media outlets. Then with breaking news from Charlottesville, Virginia. Some of this is gonna be disturbing. The images show this car speeding forward to plow right into the pedestrians, then backing up, hitting more people and speeding away. <laughs> And you had some very bad people in that group. But you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. 
you had people in that group excuse me excuse me i saw the same pictures as you did causing all the well-known leaders to be denounced and then banned from all major social media platforms after the alt-right was losing its ability to reach younger men and slowly dying out meanwhile ben shapiro and the daily wire were continuing to grow they started to sign all the major conservative youtube players onto their catalog of right-wing podcasts they kept the older ideas of conservatism. While Trump was elected, Daily Wire hosts mostly opposed him as the best candidate, but still preferred him over any of the Democratic candidates. Just as the left was dividing over populist versus establishment leaders, the conservative movement was no different, and the Daily Wire definitely sat on the establishment side. Populism is founded on the idea that there is a group of elites that work against the needs of the people. For the left, this is mostly an economic issue. Businesses are using money in politics to make sure people can't get things like fair wages and free health care. While for the right, it's a social issue. Elites are brainwashing our kids with ideas about transgenderism and trying to overrun the country with immigrants. But both sides employ the same tactics. They need a bad guy who is at the root of all your problems. Now you just need a hero, a politician who isn't part of the establishment. The establishment is seen as a group of old career politicians who are gatekeeping all the power with bribes and blackmail because the elites are paying them. Now one great man who doesn't cower to money or threats can arrive to drain the swamp. He can point at all the mainstream media organizations and trusted institutions as people who are paid to help the establishment and report only the information given to them by the elites. So you can't trust or believe anything that they say. Now there's no one else you can trust but your hero. Populism isn't about who is right or wrong. It's about who is good and who is evil. And you have to pick a side. They'll employ rhetorical tricks that aren't lies but don't really represent the truth. Conspiracy theories about big tech, big pharma, and big business make it easy to blame all the people's problems on the ones in charge. The hero never has to prove their theories. They just need you to question the authority. Anytime they're called out for being wrong, it's the elites trying to fight back by lying and slandering them. This is team sports. Are you going to help the good guys or the bad guys? You're oppressed. You're a victim. You could do so much more. But first, you need to stop those who are holding you down. Populism is about the people fighting back against the powerful to get what is rightfully owed to them and break the system that's oppressed them for so long in the process. So as the right wing becomes more and more populist, they also become more and more susceptible to more and more conspiracies that employ the same tactics of fear mongering, illogical thinking, and victimhood. By 2022, the alt-right was no longer a movement. All the groups split up and stopped working together, attempting to build their own movements, but failing at it. As their followers got older, they aged out of their activism days and got jobs, families, and had bills to pay. Their leaders were all blacklisted and banned, losing their abilities to recruit newer, younger minds that would take up the mantle and continue the fight. Their reliance on platforms like YouTube and Twitter made them lose their ability to communicate with anyone as they died out, all except one. Nick Fuentes. Probably the youngest of all the alt-right leaders, he built his own platform, Cozy TV, where he and his generals could stream speeches to their live audiences and keep the movement alive. What people if are Jews saying, say I'm not allowed to be mad about it, I'm mad about it all of a sudden. They were able to continue recruiting high school and college-aged kids who would replace the old guys aging out. Nick was hosting his own show called the America First Podcast, deeming his movement the America First Movement, a Christian nationalist group that put God in Christ at the front of their movement and appealed to Gen Z. They separated themselves from the rest of the alt-right, calling them Wignats. Wignat is a derogatory term for white nationalists who aren't smart about their rhetoric and appearance. They say the quiet parts out loud instead of using dog whistles. They're skinheads who talk about ethnostates and hating the Jews. Nick instead wanted his political movement to appear to be about getting Christianity into politics from the outside, but for everyone on the inside to know the truth. Ben Shapiro and his group of Daily Wire podcast hosts were going around the country giving speeches at colleges. At the end of every speech, they would give the audience a chance to come up to a mic and ask a question, creating viral Ben Destroys clips. I'm saying that the Boy Scouts have a standard. You must be a biological boy to be a Boy Scout. You have to be a boy to be a Boy Scout. In the name Boy Scouts. Nick was very outspokenly against Ben and the Daily Wire. So he encouraged his followers to go to college campuses and ask hosts why they don't support real Christian policies, like outlawing gay marriage, or why they allow immigration if they are America first. Recently you gave a speech at Stanford about Nick Fuentes, who you called an alt-right lead influencer. My question is this, it seems like conservatives like you, like Charlie Kirk, 
like Dan Crenshaw, feel threatened by America First conservatives and America First ideas, is this why you're smearing them as alt-right, racist, homophobic, and all these other things, instead of actually addressing their ideas and debating them? So first of all, I'm happy to address any ideas. I'm not happy to debate somebody who has joked about murdering me. That's, that's Fuentes. Uh, as, far as, as far as some of the other... The America Firsters started following around every major conservative pundit, yelling at them and saying they weren't real Christians. This was deemed the Groiper Wars. Clippable moments of kids trolling the fake conservatives helping grow the movement. From then on, Nick Fuentes' followers were called Groipers. They continued to gather in large groups to combat mainstream conservatives, BLM, and Antifa. Nick even ended up following Ben Shapiro and his family while out in public and taunting them. And you won't even look hey, at hey, 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 he's with his kids. Come on, I'm hey, right hey. here. Oh, oh, oh. Hey, 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 let him cross. Man. Let him cross. I know you're with your family, but I can't get to anywhere else. A 45 minute speech? Let him cross. Wow. Well, that's, that's our free speech warrior, everybody. Champion of the battle of ideas. Woo! Good job, man. When Nick and his Gripers went to CPAC, the largest conservative conference in America with all the most influential pundits, activists, and politicians on the right, Nick got banned. So Nick started his own conference called AFPAC, the white nationalist alternative to CPAC, even getting some well-known politicians to come speak, though some claimed they didn't know who Nick was beforehand and denounced him later. He was a black sheep that no one would touch with a 10-foot pole. Even conservatives who might be a bit more sympathetic to his cause didn't want to muddy their reputations by being seen with Nick. And while Nick was outcast and stuck in his echo chamber, the idea of optics that separated him from the Wignats slowly dwindled away. His anti-Jewish rhetoric got more and more extreme. He was much more open with racial slurs, misogyny, and anti-Semitism as he spoke to his young audience on his secluded live stream surrounded by like-minded children. I can see the conservative movement is slowly coming back around to its implicit racism of the old of the old days. You know, like I remember when Obama was president, there definitely was some thinly veiled you know, racism there. All content creators knew not to associate with Nick or give him a platform. Don't give him the ability to gain an audience again. Not because he's so clearly correct, but because he's not so clearly deceptive. While fitting the definition of white nationalism, anti-Semite, and misogynist to a T, he refutes those labels. He claims activists and Jews are always changing the meaning of the words, only to target victims like him, when in reality, these are fairly new words in history and are continuously changing to fit the times. When people say those words, he is the conceptual embodiment for what it is people are attempting to communicate. The Daily Wire continued to eat up the conservative landscape, adding Jordan Peterson, Brett Cooper, and Prager U to their catalog, becoming a conservative podcast superpower. They had all the biggest names in the game. But then they signed Candace Owens, who was also a big name, but was never capable of arguing her ideas in a coherent manner. I remember thinking this was out of character for the Daily Wire at the time. Candace wasn't a serious thought leader. She was mainly just a provocateur. Everyone at the Daily Wire is provocative sometimes, but they are also lawyers and writers. There's a substance to their shows. They dig into philosophy, legal theory, theology, and political science. Candace is a tabloid for conservatives. Right now, God, I'll address it right now. Lives, I love it. I love it. Up on it. But they also hired Brett Cooper to do pop culture. So maybe it's not all that out of character. Candace's first appearance in the limelight was when she sued her high school for racial discrimination with the help of the NAACP, only to later say she was forced to do it by her elders. To call somebody okay. the aggressor. So how do you describe it? That you experienced a hate I crime? I experienced something that was labeled a hate crime. I, w I wouldn't even call it a hate crime. I think we live in a label-obsessed culture, and before we seek to understand what happened, we seek to, like... Put it in a box. Yeah. She then created an anti-bullying website during Gamergate that was meant to dox young bullies on the internet. It was widely denounced by both sides of the fight as a horrendous idea. Website, anytime you public people's personal information, it is doxing. It's not personal information. Why not? Because it was public. Because it was on Facebook? It, it, that's still the definition of doxing. If you share someone else's... No, it's not. If you share someone... No, it's not. You can't change the definition of doxing. If on, you, I actually have the definition right here. Good. If, Later, Candace was seen in congressional and House Judiciary Committee hearings getting into fights with other guest speakers and congressmen and claiming racism doesn't exist from white people but from black people. One of people. these manifestos. Now, you're of course not responsible for 
the words of somebody writing that document. But I do think that laughing at it is a real problem. You didn't say it doesn't matter about the subject matter of today's hearing. You said there are other subjects that matter as well, and maybe we should spend some time on those. Is that accurate? That is correct, and they matter much, 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 much more. And I have said that. I said that in my opening, and I will say it again. You know that white supremacy and white nationalism is nowhere near, ranks nowhere near the top of the issues that are facing black America. There, a clip is played of Candace, where she claims Hitler would have been fine if he had just stayed in his own country. I agree. I, I actually don't have any problems at all with the word nationalism. I think that it gets, uh, the definition gets poisoned um, by uh, leaders that actually want globalism. Globalism is what I, what I don't want. So when you think about whenever we say nationalism, the first thing people think about, in, at least in America, is Hitler. You know, he was a national socialist. But if Hitler just wanted to make Germany great and have things run well, okay, fine. The problem is, is that he wanted, he had dreams outside of Germany. He wanted to globalize. He wanted everybody to be German, everybody to be speaking German. This was replayed by Media Matters and tons of other left-wing outlets, as though Candace was denying the Holocaust was bad. Happy Monday! Hitler was just trying to make Germany great again, and Candace Owens is okay with that. Now, I'd like to sympathize with Candace here for a moment. She's simply a victim of her own early success with a bottomless pit of money backing her every step of the way, endlessly supporting her whenever she has nuclear takes like Hitler's nationalism wasn't bad, actually. She's certainly defending Hitler. She was asked about nationalism in Western politics, and she brings up Adolf Hitler and how his real wrong step was becoming a global. I mean, if he wanted to just slaughter Jewish people in Germany, it'd be totally fine. But the problem is he wanted to go global. You know what I'm saying? He didn't want to keep it within his borders. That was the real problem. She was hired by Charlie Kirk in Turning Point USA to go around to college campuses and argue with students, claiming feminism was oppressing women, Democrats were oppressing black people, and the left is oppressing white people. All scenarios where she is claiming victimhood for one group and oppression for another, and in each instance, wildly reversing what the consensus and experts would say. Candace eventually started what she called Blexit, an ode to the British exit of the European Union named Brexit. Blexit was pushing for a black exit of the Democratic Party, what she referred to as the Democratic Plantation. The idea is that Democrats convince black people that they are oppressed, and that Democrats are the only ones who can help them. That's what keeps black voters voting for leftist policies in every election. But Democrats aren't actually going to enact policies that will improve their lives because then black people wouldn't need them anymore. She felt as though Trump would improve their lives if they would just vote for him. In 2018, Kanye West tweeted that he loved the way Candace Owens thinks. Kanye was in a spiral doing and saying out of character things like wearing a MAGA hat and meeting with Donald Trump. Candace followed Kanye onto TMZ where they argued that being a slave was a choice and a mindset before going on off topic tangents. Walking off the set to argue with reporters and getting Candace in on the debate. I represent that, it represents something different. So for me to wear that hat means I, I want to make America uh, great in my own in my own way. And I was addicted to opioids. Two days I got off of opioids, I'm I'm in the hospital, right? I'm taking two. Hey, everyone, listen to this, please. Two days before I was in the hospital, I was on opioids. This reality has been forced upon us. It is a choice, just like when I said slavery is a choice. The reality, we can make our own reality. We can talk about history, but not too long. We need to talk about our now, because we can fix and start loving each other now. I say we have no enemies. We don't have enemies. Black people have a tendency to focus and march when a white person kills a black person or wears a hat, but when it's 700 kids being killed in Chicago, it's okay. It's okay for blacks to kill blacks, but if it's a white uh, thing... I don't think anybody's saying that's okay. That's, no, wait, 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 There's been stop, more focus stop, stop. and more marches that is a lie. about Yo, don't whites that. killing blacks there, wait, wait, wait. than there, kids there, in wait, Chicago wait, 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 killing each other. That's a lie. There are black people working... There are, there are no marches oh, no. Black no, that's a fact. Black crime is a fact. But there, no, that is a fact. Black crime is a fact. 
But there but are well, black people. Black okay, wait a second. Black. Now wait, this is a problem. Wait, wait a second. We have to. You're you're too far. You have to be closer to me. I'm, I'm here right now. There are black no, people working every brother, single day. Brother, don't you scream because it will make us look crazy. I don't care how we look in front of this. You talk as a come on. No, when you when you scream, when you scream and you don't talk, it doesn't look right. Let me just say something. Let me say something. Let me put this upon you. Okay, this is a perfect example of what I'm talking about because these are two different versions of somebody else's truth. This is two different versions of somebody else's truth. So he gets up and he's talking slavery, right? Okay, I don't, I'm not enslaved. So that it's like, I, I don't mean to insult his reality. No, Kanye, come on over. I don't over. mean to I just want to give him a hug. <laughs> <laughs> All right, right? Like, I don't no. mean to. No, no, I think, I think he let's, might let's, want to punish me, but I want to give him a hug. Ben Shapiro's slogan has always been, facts don't care about your feelings. These are facts, and facts don't care about your feelings. He uses facts that may be inconvenient and attaches them to his values to come to logical conclusions within his ideology. And this wasn't just something Ben said, but more of a mantra for the culture at the Daily Wire. They enjoyed debates where they argued facts from a conservative perspective, but that was never Candace. She was never one to care about facts that attached to her values, but instead facts that backed up the conclusions she had already started with, one that would appease those around her. She would divert debates from lines of logic to argue who is more of a victim. She'd rather engage in oppression Olympics than the marketplace of ideas. She consistently got into drama with other conservatives while podcasting with PragerU, and that carried over to the Daily Wire. Candace and Ben always had a contentious relationship, even before she was with the Daily Wire. So I need to ask you about the Kanye issue. So uh, famously, we had a little bit of a tête-à-tête -tête on, on Twitter yeah. uh, when, I, when Kanye came out and he was uh, supporting President Trump. And I said, live by the Kanye, die by the Kanye, which yeah. is mainly me saying, you know, Kanye takes a lot of positions on a lot of different issues. Uh, and you got a little bit upset about that, it seemed. And they continued to fight publicly while working together. In 2022, Kanye West tweeted out, I'm going to go Death Con 3 on Jewish people, getting tons of backlash from both the left and the right. But Candace defended him, claiming he meant something very different, but then defended his claims by saying, He's just asking questions. Denise, she was in my wedding, I was in her wedding. We're very close, we've been friends our entire lives. And Denise happens to be Jewish. Oh, wow. Did I just say that a Jewish person in my life was cheap? Well, clearly that is anti-Semitic because it wasn't problematic, of course, a few paces ago when I said my husband, who was a devout Catholic, is cheap. It wasn't problematic when I said Savannah, who is a Protestant, is cheap. But God forbid, God forbid you say that a Jewish person is cheap. Even if it's factually true, the entire world implodes. My first instinct was to go, what did he actually say? Right? It wasn't to go, oh my gosh, Kanye West hates Jewish people. I know that's not true, obviously, because I'm friends with him and I am friends with his Jewish friends. You have a right to ask questions and you have a right to question someone's motive, irrespective of their race, their gender, their background, certainly their religion. I don't care. I don't care if you pray on the rosary. I don't care if you have a Star of David around your neck. If I have a criticism that I would like to launch about you or that I would like to say, I'm gonna say it. If you are an honest person, you did not think this tweet was anti-Semitic. You did not think that he wrote this tweet because he hates or wants to genocide Jewish people. This does not represent the beginning of the Holocaust. That's if you're an honest person, you'll meet that. You, you will admit that. What is Death Con 3? Did he mean Death Con 3? which would be a military defense position, not an offense for those of you that are offended, a military defense position. He can't believe that he's not free to talk about people in his life who happen to be Jewish, right? If you're a liar, you'll say, I know I was scared, Candace. I actually thought that Kanye West was going to launch a military strike in Israel. Now, once again, I wanna make this very clear. This is not a defense of his tweet. This is an open question which never seems to happen anymore. It's like you cannot even say the word Jewish without people getting upset in the same way that you're not allowed to say black anymore. You're Hispanic, you're racist, you're Duchess, you're misogynist. And that's all I have to say about that. That's all I have to say about that. Kanye went on to say more and more anti-Semitic things and Candace continued to defend him. Each time she got any heat, she would just say the backlash was for refusing to participate in cancel culture. But instead, it was for defending anti-Semitic remarks and saying anti-Semitic things herself. 
She refused to actually engage with criticisms of her and continued to try to convince her audience that this was all just a left-wing tactic to silence her free speech. Or did what aboutisms, pointing at what the left allows people to say without getting canceled. This was the first time I ever actually thought Candace might be anti-Semitic. She hyperbolizes the accusations against Kanye instead of arguing why they're wrong. Like saying his comments don't represent the beginning of a holocaust, or that he wasn't going to launch a military strike in Israel. Absolutely nobody thought either one of those things were happening. Anti-Semites are really good at recognizing patterns when they want to, but then discounting them when convenient. They'll point to a bunch of things that are actually true. Jewish people are disproportionately in positions of power and influence in America. They disproportionately own top finance companies. They disproportionately own major media companies. They are disproportionately lawyers, doctors, and CEOs. According to Pew Research, about 35% of Forbes' top 400 billionaires are Jewish, while only being about 2% of the United States. Usually, the reason for pointing this out is to imply that there's a Jewish cabal, controlling the world, pushing for globalism, and world domination. They think these stats prove the theory, but they never have evidence of any of these people working together or planning. They think the numbers are enough proof by themselves. It's just simple pattern recognition, they say. Candace defends Kanye by giving an example, saying that just because she called her friend, who happens to be Jewish, cheap, this doesn't make the comment anti-Semitic. And this is true. But if you build a pattern of calling people who just happen to be Jewish, cheap, the picture starts to become a bit more clear. Simple pattern recognition. We also don't normally say things for no reason. So if instead, Candace had said, my Jewish friend is cheap, now the friend doesn't just happen to be Jewish, but it's clearly a motivating factor in her reasoning. Kanye was continuously mentioning rich Jewish people who were screwing him over. The initial tweet didn't just say, I'm going to go DEFCON 3 on the Jews, clearly pointing out their Jewishness, but also said, you guys have toyed with me and tried to blackball anyone who ever opposes your agenda, clearly playing into the Jewish cabal theory to complain about Mark Zuckerberg, since Kanye had been banned from Instagram earlier that day for other anti-Semitic comments. But even though he specifically mentions them being Jewish, Candace will still pretend the people he's talking about just happen to be Jewish. And Kanye continued to play into these tropes and types of rhetoric on Piers Morgan. So what did you mean by that? What, what was, here's your chance to clarify what you meant by Death Gone 3 on Jewish people. Well, thank you for allowing me to say what I meant due to the fact that I was blocked by Jewish people. <laughs> Being that I'm an entertainer, I've been wronged so many times by Jewish businessmen. Maybe they would feel the pain of when a black artist looks up and they've been completely, they've completely been raped by five Jewish businessmen. And there's multiple accounts. Why does of the fact that happening? they're Jewish have anything Maybe to do with it? Maybe they would feel like that. But why? Why would you say it again? It just so happens they are. Well, okay, but it, I wouldn't. I, why categorize them according to their religious faith? Are the are the people, the Jewish businessmen that led me to that place? Are they sorry for the way they raped me? I don't people? know who you're talking about in particular, but I don't know why you keep having to say and they're by Jewish. The way, you wouldn't, what is the fact would, they're Jewish got to do with anything? Why do you keep what doing that? What do you that? mean? They're the Jewish businessmen that did that. Because They're business they are. people. That's what they did. Why do you keep saying Jewish business people? Why do you keep using okay, their religion, me, let me, let me, their okay, ethnicity? Why do you keep me, doing up, that? Let me update it then. Okay. Okay. So I'll say this. Would it be, would, would I have grown into the box you want me to go on if I say to specify the business people that have raped my people that just so happen to be Jewish. Both Ben Shapiro and Dennis Prager attempted to defend Candace. They talked about her good works in the conservative movement and said they don't think she hates Jewish people. But also, they said they wish she would stop defending Kanye's rhetoric and be more critical. She quickly thanked her Jewish friends for their defense by tweeting out an article by Max Blumenthal that said, white American Jews are living through a golden age of power, affluence, and safety. Acceptance of this welcome reality threatens the entire Zionist enterprise, from lobby fronts like the ADL to Israel, because Zionism relies on Jewish insecurity to justify itself. Which swiftly received a response from Ben on Twitter. 
but Candace at this point had built a pattern of pushing Jewish conspiracy theories. We have hundreds of thousands of people here, and I just want them to be recognized by the fake news media. Turn your cameras, please, and show what's really happening out here, because these people are not going to take it any longer. They're not going to take it any longer. After Nick Fuentes and his America First Groypers took part in the riots at the Capitol on January 6th, Nick claimed his bank accounts were frozen and he was put on a no-fly list for political persecution. Is this the airline? Is this the airport? Is it the TSA? Is it a federal thing? Am I on a no-fly list? Or is this something that's being administered by an airline or, or something more local? She didn't have any answers for me. She just told I couldn't get on a on a plane. I the TSA says that they banned Fuentes from flying because he posed a safety risk to crew members and threatened to strangle flight attendants. Excuse me, could you put your mask on? Uh, yeah, and let me tell you, I'm gonna land and then I'm gonna get in the airport parking lot and I'm gonna wait for you. <laughs> and then I'm gonna put a mask over your face, your mouth and nose. You still need to be wearing the mask, even if you can't breathe, so. When Elon Musk took over Twitter, Nick was reinstated for less than 24 hours before getting banned again. Fuentes was brought back on the platform briefly after being suspended back in July of 2021. Fuentes' brief re-entry back into the Twitter sphere prompted the Republican National Committee to consider an official condemnation of both Fuentes and associate Kanye West, according to reporting from Politico. But Nick started to make friends online and got numerous appearances on the left-wing live stream, Destiny. A fast-growing political debater gaining connections in the larger podcast game while continuing to debate people like Lauren Southern and Richard Spencer. He made a name for himself debating the alt-right while playing video games on his Twitch live stream. He clearly denounced their ideas while maintaining a friendly and professional relationship. But when Destiny's Jewish friend, Mr. Girl, got upset that Destiny went out for chicken and waffles with Nick Fuentes. It's annoying, I'll say when people do it. It does annoying. matter. It matters to me because he wants to kill me, Stephen. I don't care that he, he wants, wants to kill, kill me. That's not he relevant to the conversation. He wants to kill my family. He wants to kill my friends. That's, That's why okay. it matters. That's cool. The Groypers mass brigaded Mr. Girl's channel and reported him to YouTube, getting him banned and his channel deleted. Very good, very good. Yo, I'm shit for it. Report him. Report these freaks. Report, 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 report. Spam, spam, spam. I've done it a couple few times. Destiny decided he couldn't hold a relationship with Nick if everyone he engaged with had to worry about losing their careers because the Groypers might go after them. Nick's chance to get back into the spotlight was ruined until he received a call from an old alt-right friend named Milo Yiannopoulos. Milo offered Nick a consulting position with Kanye West's campaign for presidency. This gave Nick and his movement a whole new avenue for visibility. He was on shows like Tim Cast and Infowars where he was able to argue for his ideas on Jewish conspiracy theories, as people like Tim Pool and even Alex Jones debated him. Even getting Nick a sit-down dinner with Kanye and Trump before Trump later came back and denounced him. Where before, people knew to stay away from Nick because he was optically toxic. Now, Nick was tagging along with the Kanye West circus that went viral everywhere it popped up. He's a skilled rhetorician that can make kicking black people out of the country sound like he's doing them a favor. Nick was part of a package deal that everyone wanted in on. Nick commonly says Jews and media and government are controlling the world. He blames wars on Jewish lobbyists and Israeli money. He believes Jews are trying to destroy white hegemony in America by bringing in immigrants. He consistently points at the amount of Jews in Hollywood and the degenerate content they make as a sign that they're decaying Christian morality. He spotlights the amount of Jewish people in banking to show they have control over everyone and have the most disproportionate power and influence. He says the LGBTQ and BLM are only gaining prominence because they're receiving tons of puff pieces on Jewish-owned media channels. He's never able to connect any of these things to their Jewish heritage, but thinks it's too big of a coincidence not to be. He says he doesn't know if Jews are all meeting in back rooms to plan and scheme, but even if they aren't, it still plays out that Jewish people are the ones behind everything wrong with America. He claims Jewish people were never oppressed. If they're so oppressed, why do they control everything? There's no way that many Jews could have died in the Holocaust. Jews are able to control the narrative to make themselves sound oppressed so no one can ever question them. 
That's why the numbers keep growing. But whenever he gets in trouble for the things he says, he claims he's not allowed to ask questions. That everyone is afraid of the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, a Jewish-run organization meant to combat anti-Semitism. But he believes their job is to make sure hate speech laws and definitions keep changing just to keep people from criticizing Israel and Jews and stopping everyone from finding out the truth. We've had Hispanics like me, and you've had Asians like Sneeko and others. You're always going to have a minority in America. It's never going to be uniform. But we are going to ensure that America is a majority white nation forever. That's it. People say, so what are you going to do? Throw everybody out? Well, a lot of people, yeah. I mean, we are. Christ is king. Christ is king. Christ is king. Christ is king. He's the king of the universe. He's the king of the world. He has to be the king of this country, too. I actually don't encourage you to go out there and tell everybody and mix company. You know, don't come home to your parents and say, hey, mom, dad, guess who runs America? <laughs> Let's not do that, okay? I came home from college. I told my parents, I said, mom, dad, you'll, you will never guess what never happened. <laughs> like, I just found out about it. <laughs> 500 young people gathered here today because word is getting out that we got to get rid of Jewish power in America. <laughs> they've done everything they can to stop it. They've censored, they've killed, canceled, blacklisted. But we are here to say that America is not a Jewish nation. America is a Christian nation. Well, and it only makes sense. If Christ is the king of the world, then Christ must be king in America. Kanye eventually disappeared. The rant stopped and he wasn't seen for weeks. The tents came down and the circus was over. But Nick didn't stop there. He went on more and more of the biggest online counterculture podcasts where he was creating waves. But when I listened to him, and Adam, you, you called him a white supremacist earlier. Well, I'm not I'm, trying, I'm not name calling at all. I'm just trying to get him to be upfront about his, his I mean, you feelings. said that. You, you said that Nick is a white supremacist. I'm curious to like what he said specifically that makes you think that. Well, I did hear leaked audio of you comparing a uh, white woman having sex with a dog Beastie to having yeah, sex with a black man and saying that it was basically the same level of degeneracy. And that was like leaked audio. So I felt like that was kind of telling about what you might say behind the scenes. Yeah, and- Maybe know, that was a joke? Well, well, no, I mean, I, I, I can explain the... It didn't sound like a joke. The left loves people like Nick because then that they can take somebody like him and take his comments, take what he says, and then spin it to that is what every America First oh, they, person yeah, believes I mean, in. Do, do you see how it could hurt the, your side of the political well, I'm I'm not conservative. I'm not a Republican. If I hurt the Republican Party, good. I mean, I support Trump. I don't but support But he's going to be the candidate for the Republican Party. So, hey, so what, did say, say, what, what, what did the email say, What did the email say, It said ban for violations of the terms of service. That's all it said? Are you That's sure? All it said. Yeah. Oh, well, 100%. do you think that going into Twitter space and saying shit like Hitler is base, I love Hitler, do you think that might be a violation of the terms? No, because what I said wasn't a violation of the terms of service. Uh, okay. Do you think it was wrong for Candace to race mix? Uh, yeah. So you don't agree with race mixing, but do you find black women attractive? Yeah. That's all. Yeah, I've said that before. Okay. okay. Well, um, I wish you, I wish you luck and you know, I don't. Wow. I really don't. I, I don't, I don't wish luck to racists. Oh, I'm not racist. Uh, yes, you are. Yes, you are, Nick. Yeah, I am a little bit yeah, racist, but. Do you respect women? Of course. But you just don't want them to have any rights. Well, I didn't say that. I okay. didn't say they shouldn't have rights. But if you don't want them to vote or drive or, or have an existence akin to what they would have in, say, Saudi Arabia, you would say that in large part, then they don't really have rights. Well, I would say probably the ideal is something more like Afghanistan, if I'm being totally honest. Like re and recent, so what, what's the recent difference between Afghanistan, Afghanistan then and Saudi Arabia? <laughs> like the brutality, I guess. It's like a little slightly more brutal. And as he went on more and more shows, his streaming website, Cozy.tv, was rising in views.
During the Russia-Ukraine war, Candace spread tons of pro-Russia propaganda but continued to claim she wasn't pro-Russia, only anti-sending aid to Ukraine, yet continued calling Zelensky evil and was very soft on Putin. Well, Zelensky has locked down. They raided churches under the guise of saying that these churches were conspiring with Russia. They, they didn't prove that they were conspiring with Russia. They just said that they were conspiring with Russia. So they not only locked and locked down and raided and took over, transferred control of churches to the state. Does that sound like democracy to you? Transferred control of Protestant and Russian Orthodox churches to the state after raiding them. But yes, he also suspended elections until further notice. He's just running the ball and assuming all power for himself. She said that Zelensky was assuming all power for himself by calling off elections, but she's wrong. The Ukrainian constitution requires him to postpone elections while maintaining martial law. And she acts like Zelensky banning the church as part of the UOC is an act of war on Christianity. While in reality, only 4% of Ukraine's population is part of the UOC. Meanwhile, the majority of Ukrainian Christians are part of the OCU and their churches are not shut down. Plus, this was a decision made after Kiev accused the UOC of ties to Moscow and spreading Russian propaganda. And the decision to ban these churches was backed by Ukrainian parliament by passing the bill, not a decision made solely by Zelensky. She said there's no proof of church leaders conspiring with Russia. Ukraine's security service initiated 68 criminal cases, including accusations of treason against representatives in the UOC, with 18 already being convicted by the time Candace recorded that episode. But Candace also said they transfer control of Protestant churches to the state, which I can't find any evidence of anywhere. Though Russia has outlawed Christians evangelizing outside of churches, and there's even reports of Russian troops unjustly killing pastors. In some cases, Candace is claiming Ukraine is evil based on incomplete information, while in other cases, she's just outright fabricating information, making Zelensky sound evil, when the reality is, is that Russia is much worse in each instance. And she repeated these talking points, among others, numerous times over the next couple months. She used similar tactics during the Israel-Palestine war. Ben has always been a staunch defender of Israel, as have other hosts at The Daily Wire. Didn't Jesus say, if a man should come into your home and slaughter your children and rape your women over your dead body, you should declare a ceasefire to give him time to celebrate his vicious enormity so he can make plans to do even worse. While Ben is obviously Jewish, all of the other hosts are loud and proud Christians. As they keep at the trend of holding the conservatism of old, their religious views say that Jews are God's chosen people. Jesus was Jewish and killed for claiming he was king of the Jews. The Bible states that he will come back in the second coming to rule over the new Israel here on earth after all the Jews profess that he is the Messiah. Everyone knows Jews don't believe that Jesus died for their sins, but Christians still have respect for the Old Testament and the history and traditions that led to their current practices. Yet younger generations of Christians don't believe this. They believe that Jews stopped being the chosen people when they turned their back on Jesus and nailed him to a cross. That's when Christians became the new chosen people. So while older Christians don't think Jews are getting saved or going to heaven, they do stand up for Jews and hold Israel as the Holy Land. Younger Christians don't feel the same kinship with Jewish people. They see them as the ones who murdered their savior and believe they are bastardizing their holy scripture. So when Ben and the other Daily Wire hosts all defended Israel's actions, Candace Owens didn't claim one side or the other, at least not explicitly. On November 3rd, 2023, Candace Owens tweeted out, no government has a right to commit a genocide, ever. There is no justification for genocide. I can't believe this even needs to be said or is even considered the least bit controversial to state. It seems pretty obvious that she's claiming Israel is committing a genocide against Palestinians, but she later claimed that she was only pushing back against genocidal rhetoric from Republicans, since some had come out saying, there's no such thing as an innocent Palestinian. This is what notoriously led to David Horwich, the Freedom Center, writing a piece saying goodbye Candace Owens, which was one of the worst smear pieces I've ever read. Goodbye David Horwich to you too, because how dare yeah. you? Yeah. How dare you lie to your audiences, claim that I said this about Israel when I was talking about Brian Mast, you just put words in my mouth, because you assumed, which is interesting by the way, that you assumed I was talking about Israel, when you can clearly see leading up to this tweet, I'm just liking um, Yashar Ali was a journalist and he was like, and he's actually pro-Israel, I think, as I, I take him. And he was like, can we all just say that this is wrong? Like what Brian Mass is doing here is wrong. And I was like, this is crazy, it's genocidal. And it's happening yeah. in an American Congress. What do you like? A, we should all always be able to say that gen the genocide is wrong. Like I, I hope 
that's okay. I feel good. I think the tweet will age well. Right. If this is true, and she's only calling out genocidal rhetoric, this is a really dumb way to do it. She didn't quote tweet anyone and didn't name anyone specific. She's a political pundit. She had to know she was using the same language as all the anti-Israel protesters claiming Israel is genociding Palestinians and committing an ethnic cleansing. Saying there's no such thing as an innocent Palestinian is a pro-war crime sentiment. But it's not really pro-genocide. It's excusing the deaths of unarmed civilians, but isn't saying that all civilians should die. So either Candace is insanely ignorant, made a really dumb tweet that doesn't make any sense, and should be sympathetic to why everyone read her tweet the way that they did and apologize, or she knows exactly what it is she's doing. The same thing she always does. Yes, uh, the, the question is about Candace Owens. I think her behavior during this administration. Without a doubt, Candace Owens. I, 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 I can't pause that. Yeah, she works my company. Yeah, and I think she's been absolutely disgraceful. I think that I think that her her faux sophistication on these particular issues has been ridiculous. It's not faux sophistication. It's ridiculous. Everybody can see the moves that she's making and the things that she's saying, and I find them disreputable. I can't respond to it beyond what he's saying because it's just ad hominem attacks. I don't know. Yeah, because it's not, you know, we disagree or yeah. I, you know, I, I don't think she's correct or maybe she doesn't know what she's talking about. It's absolutely disgraceful. Yeah, exactly. And I would be embarrassed. I would. So I think that the video speaks more to Ben's character than it speaks to mine. Has he texted you to apologize or explain or anything? No, nothing. I haven't heard a single word. It just was sort of something that he said. And you know what? Ben and I have many disagreements, so I don't think that that's particularly something that's interesting. Um, we disagreed on the COVID vaccine. We disagree yes. on Ukraine and Russia. He has taken virtually every stance that has been the opposite of mine. On November 14th, 2023, Candace tweeted out scripture without an explanation for what she was saying. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely, for my sake. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And then she responded to her own tweet with, Christ is King. Ben Shapiro responded with, Candace, if you feel that taking money from the Daily Wire somehow comes between you and God, by all means, quit. Instead of Candace apologizing or defending her tweet, she instead claims victimhood by saying that Ben is attacking her for quoting scripture. Other Christians started to repeat this sentiment. Candace replied below Ben's tweet saying, you have been acting unprofessional and emotionally unhinged for weeks now. And we have all had to sit back and allow it and have all tried to exercise exceeding understanding for your raw emotion. But you cross a certain line when you come for scripture and read yourself into it. I will not tolerate it. I think the bigger problem that they're having is that Candace wants a, a, a glorious exit. And nothing would be better than if the Jew fired her for, so that she can go launch a new media company, maybe with Tucker. I, I don't know exactly. Uh, but Ben sat on this for a long time. You know, Ben's get, been getting hit from people on his side saying, oh, you let her, you let someone who works for you. And I don't know that Ben fully runs operations there anymore, but he's the, you know, he's the face of the Daily Wire. You let this person continue to work there after the craziness with Kanye and everything else. So Ben is getting hit on both sides, right? He's getting hit on the Candace side of things. Uh, and then he's also getting hit from his base saying, oh, we told you, like, what did you think was gonna happen here? Two very articulate and passionate people in Ben and Candace, uh, who, who's, conflict of visions on this issue spilled out into into the public square, which is going to happen from time to time. I'm, I wish it hadn't happened the way that it did, but it's going to happen from time to time. And uh, yeah, I think it just is sort of the territory when you decide to start a media company and give people broad freedom to express opinions. Now, obviously opinions within certain parameters, you know, if, as I said a year ago, if Candace said on the air things that uh, Kanye West was saying a year ago, I I would have to step in or, or whoever was operating the company at the time would have to step in. But that's not what Candace has done. Not only is Ben obviously not attacking her for quoting scripture, but she has a history of using Christianity to attack others. And then when she's called out, she claims they are attacking her for being religious. It's pointedly ridiculous. Now, why are we talking about him again? Well, when in closing back in January, I essentially said 
that we were no longer going to talk about Steven Crowder, and I instead offered that people should pray for him because obviously, when a man does something like that, he is broken. You don't do something like that to your friends unless there is something going on in your personal life. Well, Steven Crowder announced this morning that he is going through a divorce, and I want to show you bits of that video. Candace, thank you so much for coming. Thank you guys so much for having me. And honestly, I really did appreciate talking to you guys. I thought it was fascinating, and I think everyone was super respectful, so I, I really appreciate it. And you, because you're so young, I'm just gonna say a prayer for you because I, I do think, you. I really do believe that in there, there's just a different life for you, and I'm just gonna say a prayer for you tonight. I just wanted to say that because say I a felt for me tonight, for I'm, me, I'm, I don't gonna, know what that prayer entails. Well, <laughs> I'm gonna say it anyways. It. Yeah. What is the? What are you trying to do? What purpose are you trying to fulfill when you, as a 35 year old man, see me sitting down with these young women, trying to say you don't need to do this, you don't have to do this for money, and you like attack it and try to be like, Candace is just a bitch, or like whatever, like she's blah 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 blah, she's just being a high school mean girl. It's like no, I am trying to tell these women that they are worth more, and when I said to that girl at the end of it which I don't believe you showed that I will pray for you and that you can do you can do much more than this that came from the heart actually. No, that, that is the most condescending thing a religious no. person can say to a non-religious person I will pray for you okay you can deal with your you know I, I know that you went to a Jesuit school and you've got some issues with somebody why do you think I have saying, issues but I meant that because I loved my because, high school because, I like, I because, think it's fine. because for me to say like I meant what I said to her that I would pray for her like when she was describing why do you need to tell very her that you'll pray for her because I, I did pray for her then do it privately why do you need to tell her that you're only telling her that because you think you've got such a condescension about you in the first clip candace is talking about how ridiculous stephen crowder was with the big con contract drama and even goes on to talk about his divorce and how ridiculous he's been talking about that saga right after reiterating what she said in another show that she knew how hard this must be for him and that she wasn't going to talk about it anymore but was instead only going to pray for him and then she continued talking about it for another 10 minutes after in the second clip she's talking to only fans and instagram models for hours explaining to them how degenerate their lives are before telling them she'll pray for them and in the last clip after Destiny tries to explain to her how condescending it is to say, I'll pray for you, in that context, she accuses him of being anti-religion instead of explaining why he's wrong, and tells him some Christians truly just want to pray for you, but that doesn't make it any less condescending, regardless of her intent. While I'll pray for you can definitely mean you genuinely care for them, is an incredibly condescending thing to say to someone after fighting with them. Context changes what we mean when we say things. I'll pray for you normally conveys that you will talk to God and ask for their betterment, essentially communicating that you just want better for that person. This is a beautiful sentiment that Christians convey to one another on a consistent basis and is one of the many great things about the virtues within Christianity. But I want better for you can also be a very catty thing to say when talking to someone who doesn't think they need better. If I have a friend who comes to me and complains that he's hit rock bottom, he's upset that he's addicted to drugs, unable to keep a job, unable to keep a girlfriend, and is finding trouble gaining any grounding in his life. It would be perfectly acceptable for me to say, I hope one day you'll be able to do something better with your life. These are words of encouragement from one friend to another in a time of need. But if instead, I just finished telling the employee behind the counter at Taco Bell that he messed up my order, that he's incompetent, and then I finish it off with the, I hope one day you'll be able to do something better with your life. That would be a very rude thing for me to say. In both instances, the words are exactly the same, but the context is different, changing what is being communicated. Anyone who lives in the South knows that, bless your heart, doesn't mean what it sounds like 90% of the time. The context of a statement and who it's being said to can change the entire meaning and intent. Tons of funny clips on the internet are making jokes out of confusing the context of a statement to make it seem as though they are saying one thing versus another. Candace didn't just tell someone she would pray for them. She said it after attacking them for their beliefs and lifestyle for a long period of time beforehand. And she didn't just make a tweet quoting scripture, but implied that Ben had dual loyalty, a common Jewish trope to claim that Jewish people's allegiances are to Israel more so than the United States, and implying another trope about Jews and money. But she also capped it off with a reply to her own tweet stating, Christ is king. Word is getting out that we gotta get rid of Jewish power in America. Christ is king! 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 They are a 
about to try to make the expression Christ is King anti-Semitic. That's coming down the pipe soon. But Let's put that on you know, we're talking. Right away. Let's get that on T-shirts. Yeah. We're being told that we are being hateful, that we are engaging in hate speech, even that we are using a dog whistle, that we are anti-Semitic. If we say something that Christians have been saying for two thousand years. When you get a bunch of fanatical militant Catholics that say Israel should be Catholic, we don't recognize Israel because Israel doesn't recognize Jesus. Jesus is king, not the Jews and not Israel. That's the kind of Christianity they find anti-Semitic. What anti-Semitism really means is that you don't accept Jews as your ruler. So when they say Christ is king is anti-Semitic, it will always be anti-Semitic. The Catholic Church will always be anti-Semitic because the Catholic Church has a rival claim on who runs the world. This is exactly why I've always called Candace Owens a medieval Jew hater, emphasis on the medieval. Because so often when she's talking about Jews or responding to Jewish accusations, she never really answers the accusations or the questions. She always kind of veers into this weird spiritual territory about how Jews don't worship Christ and how Christ is king. This is how she responded to two Orthodox Jews, me and my dad, this morning when we raised valid arguments against her. Christ is king. Every knee will bow. She doesn't actually answer the questions or the accusations. Her answer is the fact that Christ is king and that one day we Jews will also bow to Christ. She did almost the exact same thing with Ben Shapiro. She simply quoted Christian scripture and then insinuated that Ben Shapiro, a Jewish yarmulke wearing man, worships money. Look at her work. You'll see that almost always when Jews are mentioned, she starts talking about demonic people, satanic people, monsters, filth. Apparently, crisis king is a racist, anti-Semitic term. That's why I said this. People, there's all this criticism right now, and we can watch some of those videos, and I, I want to catch up all the Candace Owens drama, but crisis king is officially, based on the ADL and Bot Shapiro, they're calling it an anti-Semitic term. That's why I say it. I don't say it because I literally believe Christ is the king of all kings. He's not the king of all kings, but I like saying that because they think it's a, it's a term. It's a term that triggers them. So if we can get something, if we can get these slogans that attack and fight back, we can use a term like crisis king to trigger the people that control the world. Jeremy Boring came out saying that he's out of town working on a movie and has an interim CEO running the Daily Wire while he's gone. So neither he nor Ben can fire Candace, nor would they if they could. She's paid to give her opinion, even if they disagree with it. Candace continued making conspiratorial and anti-Semitic comments. That was just Michael Jackson being crazy and being a raging anti-Semite. John Branca is Jewish and Tommy Mottola is also Jewish. Wow. Did you guys know that? Did you guys know any of that? Because I certainly didn't. So yes, Michael Jackson's estate was transferred over to specific individuals who happened to be Jewish. So what do we make of all of this? What do we make of all of this? What do you think about all of this? Well. I'm going to be honest with you that these claims keep coming up too often in Hollywood for me to be comfortable with it. And even when Kanye did share that he was speaking about specific, specific people in Hollywood that he believed were coming after him and were trying to control him, he actually named some of those individuals. He shared personal text messages uh, of a friend of his, a personal trainer to the stars, who again happens to be Jewish. It's utterly ridiculous, it's insane. I know many Jewish people watch this show. Many Jewish people are my friends. And so what I believe is something that should be explored is whether or not what's happening is that just like within all communities, there are gangs, right? Gangs can form, we understand this. In the black community, we've got the Bloods and we've got the Crips. Well, imagine if the Bloods and the Crips were doing horrific things, murdering people, controlling people with blackmail. And then every time a person spoke out about it, the Bloods and the Crips would call those people racist. What if that is what is happening right now in Hollywood, if there is just a very small ring of specific people who are using uh, the fact that they are Jewish to shield themselves from any criticism? It's food for thought, right? And I think, again, there have been enough people that are speaking out about a ring in Hollywood, also a ring potentially in DC, that we should start to ask those questions, all of us, Black, Spanish, Jewish, Chinese, Japanese, all Americans should want answers because this appears to be something that is quite 
sinister. Candace never explicitly states that she believes the conspiracies. Instead, she plays a clip of lackluster evidence and then says, wow, what do you guys think? This is happening too often. We all need to be asking questions. This really seems sinister. Never really taking a strong stance or telling you what her position is. Which by the way, brings me to number two on the did you know question. Because this really blew my mind. Do you know which books the Nazis were burning? When you're in the public school system, you, you really focus on World War II and the Nazis. So I was shocked that I never learned throughout that schooling that the brown shirts, you know, the, the student activists that went around burning a bunch of books were burning books that they deemed to be Marxist and that they deemed to be overtly sexual. She never took any pro-Palestinian nor anti-Israel stances either, at least not explicitly. It gets especially senseless when we are being emotionally manipulated to want to support causes overseas. And I didn't support our money being sent to Afghanistan. I did not support our money being sent to Ukraine. I did not support, therefore, our money being sent to Israel. But she had numerous pro-Palestinian advocates on her show without challenging them much, like Norman Finkelstein. And originally, it's true, they weren't aiming directly at, an eth uh, at a genocide. They were aiming at an ethnic cleansing. And then had heated debates with pro-Israel advocates, like Rabbi Barclay. So to say that we can't even explore that possibility that Rabbi Shmuley, you know, and that, that, that this list that somebody is giving or something that artists are saying might be true is somehow anti-Semitic. I'm not saying all black people or I mean, I'm sorry, all Jewish people are gang members. I am no, saying yes. that it is, of course, possible that a gang is operating anywhere in the world. That should just be allowed to be said without being accused of creating sorry, a trope. Candace, I keep telling you the things you have said repeatedly are hurtful to a huge number of Jews and are considered anti-Semitic. Could you okay, provide so for us a definition of anti-Semitism? It's no longer against them for their religion, it's against them for their race. Because anti-Semitism is the oldest hate in the world and the hate that mutates. You said it's a hate that mutates. Correct. So, your belief then is that the definition of anti-Semitism can necessarily change, is that correct? It's not just my belief, it is the commonly accepted understanding in both the Jewish and academic worlds. I would just say off the bat, I do not accept that definitions can just mutate. That is something that I, mean, I could debate that on, like the definition of a woman, I mean, and I'm saying not just about Jewish people, I think that we have to have a concrete definition to work with because then you can just update and say actually, I've changed that, and now this is what constitutes anti-Semitism. This is actually one of the dumber points from anti-Semites. They complain that the definition of anti-Semitism changes, not because it doesn't make sense for definitions to change, because words and definitions are constantly changing, but because they are mad that they fit the definition. I mean, anti-Semitic statements are never good for anybody, right? It's kind of like being anti-Black. You know, it's really interesting. I didn't realize that I could be considered anti-Semitic till I read one of the definitions of anti-Semitism. Look at this. The definition says, making mendacious, dehumanizing, demonizing, or stereotypical allegations about a world Jewish conspiracy or of Jews controlling the media, economy, government, or other societal institutions. But isn't that what you said? That Jews run everything? Yeah, but that actually is considered to be anti-Semitic. Right. People like Nick, Kanye, and Candace want anti-Semitism to mean hateful of Jewish people. Because as long as they don't feel like they hate Jews, they can feel better about themselves. But just as the word racist evolved, so did anti-Semitic. Racism used to mean tribalism and superiority based on race. But over time, we started to describe the person as a racist and their actions as racist. Meaning you could be a racist, a noun, or be racist, an adjective. In actions of a racist, one who thinks their race is superior, shows patterns of unfair discrimination when it manifests. So we use words like racist or racism to communicate unfair discrimination based on race or ethnicity, just as we use anti-Semitism to mean unfair discrimination towards Jewish people. Some definitions may add words like prejudice, which is a bias, which would lead to unfair discrimination, or antagonism, or hostility, which would lead to unfair discrimination, 
or they may word it a bit differently, but pretty much all definitions are the same. Using tropes and stereotypes are types of unfair discrimination and are patterns we would see from people who hate Jews or believe they're superior. Saying an individual black person or a group of black people are more likely to be criminals because of their race is not only fallacious, but a type of unfair discrimination because it's fallacious. And as mentioned earlier, people rarely mention things for no reason. If you're mentioning one's race or ethnicity, it's likely a motivating factor in your reasoning. So when Candace, Kanye, and Nick all keep mentioning the Jewishness of the people they're complaining about, over and over and over, the Jewishness seems to be a motivating factor. Who, again, happens to be Jewish, happens to be Jewish, just happened to be Jewish, just happened to be Jewish, who, again, happens to be Jewish, who happened to be Jewish, happens to be Jewish. Oh, wow. Even though she keeps saying they just happen to be Jewish. Candace pushing on the definition of anti-Semitism is a common tactic from neo-Nazis. They know they fit the current definition, so instead they argue that it's a bad definition because they don't want to believe they're anti-Semitic. They say things like, the ADL keeps changing the definition of anti-Semitism, or did you know the ADL includes questioning the Holocaust in the definition of anti-Semitism? Or the ADL thinks criticizing Israel is anti-Semitic it's in the definition. And these are dumb things to say. I'll explain. So first off, the ADL doesn't decide the definition of anti-Semitism. Their definition is on their website. It says the belief or behavior hostile towards Jews just because they are Jewish. It may take the form of religious teachings that proclaim the inferiority of Jews, for instance, or political efforts to isolate, oppress, or otherwise injure them. It may also include prejudiced or stereotyped views about Jews. The ADL's definition is pretty much the same as all other definitions of anti-Semitism, really just talking about unfair discrimination based on religion or ethnicity pertaining to Jews. But second off, the ADL doesn't include questioning the Holocaust or being critical of Israel in their definition. On their website, they show the working definition of the IHRA, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. They use a similar definition as everyone else, but they also show examples of anti-Semitism, which would obviously include things like Holocaust denialism, conspiracies about Jewish cabals, anti-Zionism, and other stereotypes and tropes. Not all of the examples on their website are inherently anti-Semitic, only common beliefs are tactics for anti-Semites, but they do update the list of stereotypes and tropes, which is why people say they're changing their definition, even though examples are very different from a definition. Candace keeps digging herself deeper. She continues to push conspiracy theories about the Jews in media and banking and starts fights publicly with Rabbi Shmuley and other Jewish figures while playing clips of small conspiracy channels touting ideas about Michael Jackson's death and Jeffrey Epstein, P. Diddy, and child molesters in Hollywood. And I so, agree, but culture is a very complicated culture thing. Culture is not Movies a complicated thing. So complicated. It's, it's, I think they, government's they are, they are deciding. That they have the amount of control over culture that you think they do. There's no shot that anybody would be able to top down control. Well, that the, much stuff. like I said, there have been a lot of a lot of evidence that has come out, whether you're looking at the Jeffrey Epstein case or you're reading through the 72 page document uh, for the Diddy lawsuit well, that I mean, suggests even the Jeffrey, that the government is involved. Even on the Jeffrey Epstein case, like what's suggesting government involvement here? What do you mean? all under the guise of just asking questions. I'm just asking questions here. Again, I'm just asking questions because it's getting pretty kooky out there. She has now bought into almost every Nick Fuentes talking point. Jewish people are the elites controlling everything. They are attacking Christianity in America. Book burnings weren't so bad. The people she's criticizing just so happen to be Jewish. No one knows what anti-Semitism means because the definition keeps changing. And anytime she's given any pushback, she plays dumb, like she doesn't know what she's saying. She claims victimhood by saying you're attacking Christianity, or she says she's not allowed to ask questions. Hey, so the problem is real. The question is, is it an individual problem or a collective problem? A problem really is a claim of victimhood. You're being victimized by something. Sometimes that's true, sometimes that's not. The next thing that happens is that you blame that on society. And once you blame the society, you very quickly end up, if you do not have evidence, at a conspiracy theory. There's a group of people who are stopping you from solving your problem. You blame society, you don't have an answer. So it must be a conspiracy. And you're just asking questions. You don't know, right? This is the game that is played by so many corrupt commentators. Just asking questions. I don't have to show you evidence that something terrible is happening. I don't have to actually demonstrate how the thing is happening. I don't have to tell you who the problem is. Wink, wink. But I can just tell you right now that there is a problem. But even, and, and if I'm asked about it, hey, I'm just asking questions. Now, let me tell you something about just asking questions for a second. Just asking questions is a game for children. My son is seven. He can just ask questions. My daughter is 10. 
she can just ask questions. If you are 50 and you are just asking questions, I don't think you're just asking questions. I think that your level of curiosity is actually quite low. I think that you don't care enough to know or know enough to care. I think that the vast majority of people who are in the just asking questions business have an answer that they want to suggest, but they know there's no evidence for it, so instead they hide behind just asking questions. In other words, they're completely full of shit. As soon as I get back in the Oval Office, I'll also immediately end the war on Christians. I don't know if you feel that. If you have a war, there's a war. Under crooked Joe Biden, Christians and Americans of faith are being persecuted and government has been weaponized against religion like never before, and also presidents like never before. Here I am. I always say Al Capone was treated better than I was treated. Scarface, Al Capone, he was a tough one. Christians are under siege. We must protect content that is pro-God. We love God, and we have to protect anything that is pro-God. We must defend God in the public square and not allow the media or the left-wing groups to silence, censor, or discriminate against us. We have to bring Christianity back into our lives and back into what will be again a great nation. On March 18th, 2024, Isaac Shore posted an article on the right-wing news outlet named Mediaite titled, Candace Owens endorses wild anti-Semitic conspiracy theory about Jews being drunk on Christian blood. Showing that Candace had liked to comment on Twitter asking Rabbi Shmuley if he was drunk on Christian blood again. And another tweet telling Rabbi Shmuley's daughter that her and her father are making it too easy for people to hate Jews. Then Isaac posted another article later that same day titled, how long will the Daily Wire stand by Candace Owens? He outlines a history of anti-Semitic comments from Candace and misinformation she's put out about Israel. Like when she told people that Muslims were forced to live in certain parts of Israel after her trip to Jerusalem. I don't think it's where they're allowed to live in Jerusalem. I think it's that there are there's an Armenian quarter. It's not saying the Armenians can only live here. It's that there are communities, just like there's a... A uh, Jewish community in in Jersey here, and there's a Muslim community in here. I don't think you know. I think but. it is where they have. I mean, at least that's what the rabbi who was taking me around. He said these are the Muslim quarters, so this is where the Muslims They're live. But I, he didn't say anything about legally saying they cannot live in other places within Israel proper. My understanding from the rabbi was that this is where the Muslims have to live in Jerusalem. It might have been a misunderstanding. Imagine if you went into an inner city in the United States and somebody told you this is a predominantly black neighborhood and you said it looked more rundown. Would you say that America is systemically racist because of If I was of giving cities? a tour of it, I wouldn't say this is the black quarters, probably. Uh -huh. Or this is a black neighborhood. But maybe somebody in the group might misunderstand that. The article quotes Jeremy Boring's tweet where he says that they won't fire Candace Owens because she's paid to give her opinion even if they disagree with it. But Isaac goes on to say, but what Boring describes as opinion can at this point be universally recognized as a misleading euphemism. Perhaps it is technically true that Shapiro and Owens have a difference in opinion over whether there is a small ring of sinister Jews exercising disproportionate power in Hollywood and Washington. And perhaps it is technically true that they disagree about whether some Jews are drunk on Christian blood. But to describe it principally as a difference in opinion is to miss the point, which is that Owens is a bigot detached from reality and paid by the Daily Wire to promote her worldview to its audience. Nick Fuentes sees Candace's feud with Ben and other Jewish leaders, her seemingly anti-Israel stance, and her use of Christ as King as a weapon against Jews, and he decides to jump in. He starts reviewing her show on his streams and praising her heavily. The background on this, Candace Owens has just been at war with the Jewish mafia lately, and she, <clears throat> I guess, insufficiently disavowed Kanye when all that was going on. So the Jews have had beef with her ever since. It goes back a little bit further, but that's really when the latest stuff began. And Ben Shapiro threw under the bus, called her an idiot in private, and it went viral. Then she went on maternity leave. But since she came back a couple weeks ago, she's been going hard on the Jews. She said that Jews were creating all this pornography during the uh, interwar period in Germany and the Nazis burned all their gay books. And she talked about how the Jews own the porn industry. And she basically talked about how there's this Jewish mafia that exists. And she's been going at it with Rabbi Shmuley on Twitter, calling him filth. Even though Nick is banned on Twitter, he made a new account with the handle Standis Owens, where he constantly tweets out his support. 
On March 19th, 2024, Candace aired an episode of her podcast titled, Why Does Everyone Think I'm Going to Be Killed? Where she chronicled every accusation of anti-Semitism that's ever been thrown her way and explained why each one of them was wrong. But none of the context that she adds actually changes any of the characterizations. How sick and how sinister is this getting? How utterly insane this is all getting? It's starting to feel like there's some sort of a bounty on my head and the person that can convince the public of something that is so ridiculous that I can't come back from is just going to receive a ton of money. And Isaac Shore is really competing for that because do you wanna know where he, he got that conspiracy theory from? A tweet that I had liked of someone defending me when Rabbi Shmuley was smearing me. He dug up an old tweet of mine that was from February, tried to present it as if it was something new and something that was about him before our back and forth ever even broke out. So I liked the tweet because it clarified the right date of the tweet, saying that, Rabbi Shmuley, this tweet is obviously from February 20th. What are you, drunk on Christian blood? I didn't even pay attention to the last part of the tweet. I just obviously liked that this person was calling out this BS smearing tactic. Little did I know that Isaac Shore and a team of journalists are now monitoring every single like of mine on Twitter to see if they can convince the public that I am advocating for insanity. This is how desperate they have become. On March 20th, Media Matters, a left-wing media watchdog outlet meant to call out right-wing channels for hateful takes and misinformation, posts an article about Nick's support for Candace titled, Holocaust denier Nick Fuentes celebrates Candace, quote, she has been in a full-fledged war against the Jews. Similar to Mediaite, the article shows Candace's anti-Semitism and points out that almost everyone she's been fighting with lately has been Jewish, drawing in people like Nick Fuentes and his fans. On March 21st, the ADL tweeted out the article from Media Matters with the caption, White supremacist and Holocaust denier Nick Fuentes is praising Candace Owens' vitriolic anti-Semitism. It's hardly surprising, but it does set off alarm bells. When bigoted people come together to push an anti-Semitic agenda, it adds fuel to the fire of hate. Candace quote tweeted this saying, I do not know Nick Fuentes, but you already know that. What I do know is that everyone can see what you guys are doing to me. Your pattern is well established and the world is waking up to it. My crime is having stood up for myself against your network of smears. It's hard to believe with Candace and Nick both close to Kanye West and engaging in similar podcast spaces that they never ran into each other. But even if that's true, and she doesn't know Nick, she hasn't done anything to denounce him either. You don't have to denounce every person who has ever said anything bad before, but if they are using your words and your image to promote their ideology, most people would make sure to separate themselves from it if they disagreed with it. I love that. I love how all the Jews have to watch this show. This is the face, dude. No, 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 no. But this is the face of a total Jewish defeat. We have to stand... Go off, girly. We fucking got your back, Candace. Eat them up. Eat them up. They are filth. But Candace hasn't done that at all. And yet, here's Nick Fuentes directly contradicting what Candace said in that tweet. But anybody who is in my inner circle can attest that in the opening weeks of Yay24, I was distraught. I talked to Candace Owens about this. I talked to Classical Theist about this. I talked to everybody around me. I said, I don't know what to do. This guy's a psycho. This guy is pure evil. I want nothing to do with him. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. In the clip, Nick not only says that he knows Candace Owens, but he mentions her as part of his inner circle, yet she'll continue to claim that she doesn't know him. You know, there was a video circulating of him calling me a disgrace or in a faux professional or whatever yep. it was. I decided to choose peace, and then when I chose peace, he responded to the peace with not not peace. <laughs> so why wouldn't he just fire you? Well, as I explained on Tucker Carlson's show, like Ben doesn't have the power to fire me. On March 22nd, 2024, Jeremy Boring, the CEO at The Daily Wire, posts on Twitter that The Daily Wire and Candace Owens have ended their relationship. They don't tell us why or give an explanation for the separation, but three separate theories start to circulate. One, that she was fired for going too far with the anti-Semitism. Two, that she was fired for being a Christian. And three, that she was fired for being against Israel in the Israel-Palestine war. Regardless of which theory one believed to be true, if they were on the right, 
and believed her firing to be unfair. They claimed it was a violation of Candace's free speech and that the Daily Wire was canceling her. But what she was being canceled for, no one was really sure. But then Candace made another ominous post on Twitter trying to give people a hint while maintaining plausible deniability. The post read, Overwhelmed by the amount of love I've received over the last 24 hours from all over the world. Thank you all. Also to my brothers and sisters in faith, who are recognizing that we need to stand by one another. There is a deep-seated hatred in the media for Christians. The worldwide persecution of Christians rarely receives coverage and is readily dismissed. We should not allow that. I don't know what's in Candace Owens' mind. I was on her show once or twice at the beginning, uh, but I never heard, listened to it. And the reason I never listened to it was because of all the stuff that I felt was silly. I mean, some of the stuff I felt I, I knew what she was going to say, which was the, you know, the Blexit stuff, which I'm all in favor of. But the stuff about the moon landing being fixed, you know, uh, rigged and 9-11 uh, being an inside job, she would hint at. And re recently there was Mrs. Macron, the first lady of uh, France, is a man and all that stuff. It's silly stuff. Then the Jew stuff started. Like some of those books Hitler burned weren't so bad. You know, I, I was shocked. This is something Candace actually said. I was surprised to learn that the books Hitler was burning or the Nazis were burning, they weren't, they weren't good books. They were bad books. They were socialist books. <laughs> so when you start saying that, you're saying, that's a dog whistle. I'm sorry. I know it's a leftist phrase. I know they use it, you know, randomly with anything you say. I understand all of that. Still, still. Again, and this is not personal animus toward her, but I find difficult to excuse this when anybody does it. The, the tr truth that hid wickedness that I thought was the most wicked truth to use was the truth that Christ is king. I am a Jew, but that hasn't happened at all. Christians have welcomed me with open arms, except this Christ the King anti-Semitic crowd. You are quoting scripture like Satan does in the Bible. So when Jeremy Boring, a Christian man, has to sign a check, a big check, to pay someone to talk about Hitler wasn't so bad in burning books, or a Jew is choking on Christian blood, or Christ is king. When Jeremy Boyne has to sign that check, he's doing something that he cannot abide. He cannot abide it. This is too far, not because of Ben, but because of what it really means. It's really this hatred of Jews this level of hatred of Jews is a hatred of God. If Candace wants to say those things about the Jews, about Hitler, no matter how she dodges and weaves, she has to leave the Daily Wire. The one reason she has to leave above every other is because Christ is king. The phrase Christ is king starts trending on Twitter again in support of Candace and in protest to her getting fired for being a Christian. I logged on to X, formerly known as Twitter, this morning to see that the words Christ is king was trending. And so in my exuberance, I immediately jumped on the bandwagon and I'm like, Christ is king. Boom. And then the comment section started filling up. Apparently, this was an anti-Semitic thing to say. What is happening? Of course, there's a catch to why this is trending. This doesn't become a left versus right fight. There are Christians who see what's happening and are upset that Candace is using Christ's name in vain. Christianity Today writes an article titled, Christ as King is not the slogan some white nationalists want it to be. They explain that using words like God and damn are perfectly fine, but when put together, the context changes the meaning and is now considered blasphemy. Nick Fuentes and other Christians continue to claim that stating a fact that Christ is king cannot be racist. They simplify their minds as much as possible to believe such childish points. The phrase 1350 was used by white nationalists back in the alt-right days as well. The idea is that FBI crime statistics show that black people commit 50% of violent crimes, while they are only 13% of the population. Pointing out the disproportionality to say that black people are inherently more violent than white people, and that we need to keep them away from women and children. So alt-writers ran around posting 1350 under black people's posts and comment sections. When others would point out how racist the sentiment is, they would claim it was a fact, and that facts can't be racist. While mentioning this statistic in a conversation about criminology obviously isn't racist, because it is a fact. Saying it at random to black people isn't just stating a fact, but communicating much more. Jeremy Boring posts on Twitter why the phrase, Christ is King, is anti-Semitic. The post states, How is saying Christ is King anti-Semitic? The same way anything becomes anti-Semitic. 
when it is used for the purpose of expressing anti-Semitism. It's like asking, how does a shovel become a murder weapon when it is used to murder someone? This isn't hard. A shovel is not innately a murder weapon. Saying Christ is king is not innately anti-Semitic. It's all about how a thing is used. Saying eat some cornbread is not racist if I say it to my three-year-old when she's refusing her dinner. If I start saying it as a response to X post by a black commentator I don't like, it has taken on a meaning beyond what is innate. Lauren Chen replies below. You say Christ is king is anti-Semitic when it's used to troll Jews. If you curse out a Jewish person and top it off with Christ is king, then certainly that is sinful in taking the Lord's name in vain. But is saying Christ is king and nothing else to a Jew trolling? I've seen people complain that it's being said in bad faith to Jews. I do not believe this is possible. Even if you are saying Christ is king to a non-believer, specifically because they are a non-believer, that is not bad faith. That is evangelism. The next day on March 26th, Lauren Chen hosted a space on Twitter where people could come talk about the Christ is king phrase and the firing of Candace Owens from the Daily Wire. The space consists of many Christians and conservative voices like Carlin Borisenko and Sovereign Bra from the Whatever podcast. Soon after the space starts, Nick Fuentes joins, and so does CEO of The Daily Wire, Jeremy Boring, where he's asked about the firing of Candace Owens. Hey, what's up, everybody? Greetings. Can you hear me? We can yeah, hear you. All right. Look, to just be plain, I mean, let's just say the elephant in the room. You know, it is about forcing a contradiction between Christianity and Jews. At least it is for me. I feel like everyone knew just, you know, a week ago, if you heard a Christ is King chant at a rally or a political thing, it's Groypers. It's Groypers that are doing that thing. The, the fundamental point I want to make is this. I think what a lot of people are afraid to say, um, and I'm not going to say it's anti-Semitic, what people are afraid to say and to own is that when you say Christ is King, it is an act of rebellion because we happen to have a conservative movement that is run by atheists and Jews and gay people. But a lot of them are Jews, disproportionately more of them, Christian conservative movement. And it is exclusionary. That is at the exclusion of people that are not Christians who are Jews. And, you know, let, but we have to own that. Yeah, well, I just, you know, let's just ask you point blank, because this is what people are going to be tweeting about when they listen to the space. When you are saying to a Jewish person specifically, Christ is king, are you doing it in a hateful way? Or is it a way, or is it an invitation? I don't hate anyone. You know, I'm, I'm branded a racist anti-Semite. I have friends of all different kinds. You know, Laura Loomer's been a close friend of mine for years. There are genuine people that hate Jews for being Jews that attack me for that. And I've said on my show, I've said, well, some of some of my best friends are Jews. Some of the smartest people I know are Jews. Hey, hey, wait, we, have, we have Jeremy yeah, Boring no, here. Yeah. Let, let's hear from Jeremy Boring. Jeremy Boring, come on up. Jer Jeremy, what did Candace do that she deserved to be fired? Well, I'm not gonna have a conversation about Candace. When you run a business, you're not at liberty to have discussions about people that you fire. Uh, I know that everybody would like for me to be able to do that. I'm not able to do that. Did the ADL or Media Matters, did they contribute to your decision to fire her? No. Media Matters is like the greatest gift ever given to the Daily Wire. I love that they literally pay people six figures a year to listen to all of my content and promote it for me. I can't believe that they continue to do it. It's the stupidest organization that ever existed. The ADL's garbage. I don't care what the ADL thinks any more than I care what Rabbi Shmuley thinks. I mean, when the when the ADL drops something like that and then Candace gets let go 24 hours later, it, it looks suspicious. Yeah, I, I understand that people who are looking for a conspiracy will find one. Ben Shapiro is as critical of the ADL as anybody out there. I've never met anyone at the ADL. I've never said a positive word about the ADL. The Daily Wire, I can't. don't think you can find a host at the Daily Wire who's ever had a positive thing to say about the ADL. Jeremy, I'm just wondering, and I guess I'm asking this as a yes or no question, did Candace Owens violate any specific policies at the Daily Wire? I'm not going to make any comment about the Daily Wire separation from Candace Owens in this forum. If, if she violated a company policy, you would have been able to say yes to the question, Jeremy. I know that much. After the Twitter space ended and everybody left, Candace commented under it saying, the most interesting part of this for me was that I never knew Nick Fuentes was blacklisted when he was just 18 years old from people at the Daily Wire, smearing him for asking questions about Israel.
Nick says they fed him to the ADL. As many people brought up in this conversation, it is ironic, to say the least, that someone clearly fed me to the ADL upon my departure from the Daily Wire. And they did this by trying to smear me as somehow connected to Nick Fuentes via Christ is King, although I legitimately do not know Nick. It's very tribal and it's very, it's very, like, even in the right. Like, look what's going on with Candace Owens and Ben I, Shapiro. Dude. Like, what did she say? I want to know what, was she, what she was fired for. Because was it criticism of Israel? Was it... Um, was she fired or did she leave of her own volition? I'm not going to speak to this topic, Pierce. At, at all? At all. You can't give me any uh, insight into why she departed? No hints, no nothing. I'm not going to speak to this. Can, can, I ask, can I ask why? I mean, you can ask. No, no, I'm not... Can I ask why you don't want to say anything? Um, again, you can ask. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean I only, I'm only curious because I know what a, a staunch defender of free speech you are, and it would surprise me if it had been someone's opinions that would make you want to part company with them. But I'm sure that whole thing was rather unpleasant. It's now spun into a debate about whether the Daily Wire is pro-free speech. Uh, the accusation is you are until it comes to Israel. How do you respond? I mean, what I will say is that we have a wide variety of positions on Israel right now inside the Daily Wire. Matt Walsh, obviously, is another one of the hosts at the Daily Wire. He and I wildly disagree about what America's Israel policy should be. Matt is much more isolationist. He basically believes the United States has no, no real interests in the Middle East, and thus the United States should not be providing material support to anyone, including the state of Israel. You know, Matt, obviously, is well within you know the, the, the sort of group of hosts that we have here at the Daily Wire. So clearly, whatever is going on is not about Israel specifically. That's really all I have to say about it. As far as the free speech of it, as I've said before, you know, the, the Daily Wire is a, a publisher, not a platform. You know, to the extent that, that the Daily Wire is in fact not a publisher, it is a pla that, that is in fact not a platform, it is a publisher, that means that there is no moral obligation for the Daily, and there's no free speech problem with the Daily Wire saying we don't wish to pay a particular host or that host saying I don't wish to work here anymore because again, there's a parting of the ways that I'm, that, you know, is not really open for discussion at this point. Everyone is able to say what they want. Nobody ever comes to me and says, you can't say X. Nobody ever says that to Walsh. No one ever said that to Candace. But the reality is that there is an Overton window at the Daily Wire. Obviously, there was a non-meeting of the minds. That's pretty much all I can say on this. Am I the only one realizing this incredible? It's in the same, it's not even like a couple minutes apart. It's not even 30 seconds apart. In the same sentence, he's saying, at the Daily Wire, Everyone can say whatever they want. You're, you're allowed to say whatever you want. No one tells you what to say. But obviously, there are certain things where if you say you won't work here. <laughs> OK, so if that's the if that's the case, why was there so much uproar when The New York Times decided to fire two of its editors for publishing Tom Cotton's op ed that called for the deployment of American military to quell the Black Lives Matter movement? The New York Times editors were simply saying what Ben uh, Shapiro was saying. On March 30th, Candace tweeted out the Glenn Greenwald clip where she states, Ben, we agreed not to talk about this, but you are very much going on a public tour right now, pretending not to talk about it while you are very much talking about it. Would you like me to do the same? YouTube shows from all over the political spectrum called out Ben in the Daily Wire for hypocrisy. In this conversation, he makes the argument for censorship, but he's basically like, there's a window of ideas we accept. So we accept ideas between here and here. And anything outside of that window, well, you're fireable. That's censorship. What? But yeah. he's acting as if this is like a justified reason for firing people when you built your identity and platform off of no censorship and freedom of yes, speech. And yeah. Facts don't care about your feelings and all this shit. It's also funny that that window happens to end where his beliefs end. Yet he was quite critical when the New York Times fired journalists for publishing Tom Cotton's article. Right. See, he was ready. I didn't know this. This <laughs> motherfucker was ready. I didn't know. I was out. I was going to do other things. Now, <laughs> now that is kind of, that kind of hypocritical, no? Seems a bit. Yeah. On the same day, an account called Censored Man tweeted out leaks from Daily Wire employees claiming that there were private meetings and that employees were being intimidated in an attempt to brainwash them that Candace Owens was an anti-Semite. And those employees are now planning a lawsuit against the company. The email read, bombshell leak. Candace Owens was fired for saying Christ is king. Jeremy Boring sent an email to all Daily Wire employees inviting them to an impromptu town hall in Candace Owens' studio. The four employees told me that the town hall attempted to brainwash the employees present into believing that Candace was 
in fact, an anti-Semite. Some employees are planning a lawsuit against the Daily Wire, feeling intimidated and threatened by the meeting, and also because of what they believe is an attack on Christianity at the company. Candace quote tweets this email saying that she'll go on Joe Rogan's show to talk about her firing while pretending not to talk about her firing. These lines didn't seem to be split on Israel, Palestine, or Jews versus Christians, or right versus left, or even whether or not you think Christ is king is an okay thing to say. All of the positions seem to be anti-establishment more than anything else. Candace Owens, Nick Fuentes, Lauren Chen, Tucker Carlson, and even Donald Trump. These are all populists. It would be easy to say that they just have a different perspective and ideology, but it becomes more and more obvious that they are completely disconnected from reality. Populists seem to almost always buy into conspiracy theories, spread misinformation, and play team sports. Similar to how liberalism will keep a separation between church and state, populists will keep a separation between mind and truth. They must deny the facts if there's a chance that it could help the bad guys. Populists already believe the government, big business, and elites are moving in the shadows to lie, cheat, steal, and kill. So of course they'll become more and more susceptible to conspiracy theories. The core belief of populism alone will breed conspiracy theorists. Once you've decided that all the people in power are lying and dishonest, you have to beat them at their own game. Donald Trump pushes talking points about Christians being discriminated against or democracy being taken, and everyone follows his lead. The misinformation will feed the bias that wants to be a victim so badly. It'll spread like wildfire. There are people who believe the election was stolen, that vaccines were bad, that Joe and Hunter Biden are running an international criminal organization, or that Kyle Rittenhouse is guilty for killing three black men, that a shadow app in the DNC stole the election from Bernie Sanders, or that every protest, both foreign and domestic, is being undercut by the CIA. The people in power are out to get them. So why wouldn't they also start to believe in anti-Semitic tropes like Jews ruling the world from a dim-lit back room while smoking cigars? You might think it's weird to say the side claiming a phrase isn't anti-Semitic is the side that desires oppression. And while I understand that sentiment, they only won't acknowledge the facts because that would deny their own victim status. In a country majority white and Christian, and with most current CEOs and presidents in history white Christians, you either aren't oppressed or you don't have a race and religion worth fighting for. When you can't acknowledge that context changes language and what's being communicated, and your arguments lack any nuance, you aren't looking for truth. When you say things like, facts can't be racist, you've absolved yourself of all faculties in a poor attempt to win at team sports. You've stopped caring about right and wrong and only care about being on the side of the good guys. And as more and more shows on both the right and the left argue over what Candace was fired for, to me, it's pretty clear. Her anti-Semitism and conspiracy theories had gone too far. People kept calling her critical of Israel, but I never really saw any explicit critiques. Only the tweet about genocide. Nick and Groypers chant Christ is King to say, Jews will not replace us. It's the phrase, it's okay to be white all over again. White nationalists use that phrase the same as they use 1350. They purposely use inoffensive language to communicate something very different because they know those who aren't in the know will defend the statements, causing an uproar in fights. That's why it's called a dog whistle. Only some people can hear what's actually being said. Is it okay to be white? Of course. Is it okay to say? Depends on the context. Just as it's okay to say Christ is king in certain contexts. But Candace obviously copied the Groyper's dog whistle when she continuously started posting it at Jewish people while also constantly complaining about the Jews on her show and copying all the other Groyper talking points. Nick says in the Twitter space that everyone knows Christ is king is a Groyper chant and that it's meant to separate the Jews from the Christians. But even with anti-Semitism as blatant as hers, we still have Daily Wire employees complaining about her firing being anti-Christian and threatening to sue the company, or Lauren Chen continuing to defend both Nick and Candace, saying they aren't saying anything anti-Semitic. He also accused Candace Owens of some pretty terrible things, dog whistling that Hitler was okay, uh, just because she did a segment about Nazi book burnings, and a lot of people don't know that actually the, the Nazis were burning like LGBT and socialist books. But it's okay, nothing to see here. Candace has Jewish friends. My best friend in middle school just happened to be Jewish. Her name was Jessie. My best friend in high school just happened to be Jewish. It's utterly ridiculous. It's insane. I know many Jewish people watch this show. Many Jewish people are my friends. And some of the 5 million followers on Twitter, the 3 million subscribers on YouTube, and the 5 million followers on Instagram are even Jewish. So she can't be anti-Semitic.
She talked about Jewish gangs murdering people and said they're using claims of anti-Semitism to stop people from discovering their ploys. That there's a ring in D.C. and Hollywood. She titled her last show with the Daily Wire trying to imply those Jewish gangs were going to kill her. She posted Christ is King and every knee will bow at Jewish people multiple times. She played into tropes about Jews and money. She defended Nazi book burnings. She liked to post on Twitter about Jewish blood libel, which is a very old conspiracy that Jews drink the blood of Christians for Passover. She made sure to mention the Jewishness of any person that was doing something wrong. She argued that Jews changed the definition of anti-Semitism so that they can weaponize it. She defended both Kanye West and Nick Fuentes' anti-Semitism. And she also continuously said that Jews are trying to guilt and scare everyone into supporting Israel. It isn't surprising at all that the Daily Wire fired Candace Owens. The only part that's surprising is that the people who so readily denounced the alt-right and were harassed by groipers didn't fire her sooner.